This video was brought to you by CuriosityStream. On Tuesday, a Russian airbase in Crimea and bridges connecting the peninsula to the mainland were struck by a number of missiles, destroying a number of jets and significantly limiting Russia's ability to use the area as a supply base for their troops in southern Ukraine. So in this video, we're going to be taking a look at Ukraine's newfound focus on Crimea. The continuing confusion over how and by whom the strikes were actually carried out, and how this might all help the Ukrainian counteroffensive in Kurzon. So before we get into the most recent developments in Crimea, a quick update on the rest of the war. As we've explained multiple times by this point, Russia's advances in the east, around Donbass and Kharkiv, have slowed to a snail's pace. Russian forces in Donbass are currently trying to take Sivetsk and Bakhmut, two small towns that lie about 40 kilometers west and southwest of Slovyansk, respectively. While Russian forces have made slight progress around Bakhmut, they're still about 10 kilometers out, and they've made essentially no progress around Sivetsk. Again, as we've mentioned in previous videos, the slowing pace of advance in Donbass does suggest that Russian forces will really struggle to take Kramatorsk or Slavyansk, the two remaining Ukrainian-held towns in Donetsk. Both of these towns are significantly larger and better fortified than either Bakhmut or Sivetsk, where Russian forces are already struggling. Therefore, a successful Russian offensive here will require either a substantial increase in Russian forces or many more months of attritional crawl. However, the big news in recent days hasn't been in Donbass. It's been focused in Crimea, and more specifically, Russia's airbase there situated just a few kilometers away from the town of Saki. That's because on Tuesday, there were a series of enormous explosions at the base, and satellite imagery released on Wednesday evening suggests that a substantial number of aircraft were destroyed by the blast. Now, it's hard to know with certainty how much material was actually damaged, because, well, the Russians haven't released any official statements on the attack. But open source intelligence suggests that somewhere between 9 and 17 jets were destroyed, as well as a number of ammo dumps. Anyway, in a video addressed the next day, Zelensky apparently acknowledged the strikes without actually confirming Ukrainian involvement, but again vowing that the Crimean Peninsula will be returned to Ukraine by the end of the war. Now, while Crimea looks unlikely to return to Ukraine anytime soon, this is still pretty good news for the Ukrainians, and correspondingly, pretty terrible news for the Russians. The events at the airbase represent the largest single-day loss for the Russian Air Force so far, and will severely impact the Russian army's ability to use Crimea as a forward operating base for their troops in southern Ukraine, especially around Kurzon, which is what they've been doing so far. And this is really significant, because most Russian forces in the south receive supplies from Russian army bases in Crimea, which are connected to mainland Russia via the Kursh Strait Bridge and air bases like this. And the air base destroyed in this attack was a major one for the region, home to the 43rd Aviation Regiment, which means that Russia will now really struggle to conduct air campaigns in the south. Now, this is particularly good news for the Ukrainians because, as we detailed in our previous Ukraine update video, evidence suggests that the Ukrainians are currently preparing for a counteroffensive in Kurzon. And by attacking Crimea, Ukraine can massively limit Russia's ability to supply and support its troops in Kurzon, improving the prospects of any future Ukrainian counteroffensive. It's also worth noting that Russia's supply lines were already feeling the strain. And that's because there are only four bridges by which Russia can resupply its troops in Kurzon, all of which have already been damaged in the war. But perhaps the most worrying aspect of all of this for the Russians is that the airbase in question is over 200 kilometers away from the front line, and nearly 250 kilometers away from Mikhailov, which is the closest large Ukrainian operating base. Now, while it originally looked a lot like a Ukrainian missile strike, it's hard to square this theory with the fact that, according to the White House, the new American-supplied HIMARS systems only have a range of 85 kilometers. 
Now, while certain munitions can increase HIMARS range to nearly 300 kilometers, Biden has so far refused Ukrainian requests for these specialized missiles, citing worries about the missiles being used to strike targets within Russian territory. It is possible that the US has secretly provided Ukraine with longer range munitions, or Ukraine might have even repurposed Neptune missiles fired from Odessa. But American news outlets have instead suggested that the attack was carried out by Ukrainian special forces. The Washington Post reported that the attack was carried out by special forces operating behind enemy lines, and an anonymous Ukrainian official told the New York Times that the attack was carried out with the help of pro-Ukrainian partisans living in Crimea. For their part, Russian state media has claimed, somewhat implausibly, that the explosions were due to negligence by Russian soldiers. But that doesn't seem all too likely. Anyway, whatever method the Ukrainians used to carry out the attack is kind of by the by. The mere fact that they could carry out an attack on Crimea 200 kilometers away from the front line is pretty terrible news for the Russians because it means that Russia's logistical operation is a lot more vulnerable than they previously thought. Take the Kerch Strait Bridge, for example, built four years after Russia annexed Crimea to connect Crimea to the Russian mainland. Now, Russian forces currently use the Kerch Strait Bridge to ferry Russian supplies to Crimea, where they can then be redeployed to southern Ukraine. And previously, the Russians would have considered the Kerch Strait Bridge completely untouchable. It's hundreds of kilometers away from Ukrainian mainland, between two territories mostly populated by ethnic Russians. However, if Ukrainian forces can strike Russian air bases in Crimea, 200 kilometers away from the front line, then there's suddenly a lot of infrastructure, like the Kerch Strait Bridge, which looks a lot more vulnerable. Now, we should be clear that we're not saying a Ukrainian attack on the Kerch Strait Bridge is imminent, or even all that likely. The point we're trying to make is that Ukraine's proven ability to hit targets deep behind enemy lines will put a strain on Russia's logistical operations. All in all then, things aren't looking good for the Russians at the moment, and it'll be interesting to see how Moscow responds in the weeks ahead. If you can't wait until then, then you can find more TLDR over on Nebula. You've likely heard us talk about Nebula before, but give me one minute to explain why you should care. And as always with TLDR, there's three points. Firstly, signing up to Nebula gets you a ton of additional TLDR content. We have a whole bunch of videos exclusively for Nebula, including all of these full-length TLDR videos, as well as exclusive interviews and a bunch of fun videos, like our studio tour and our team attempting the British citizenship test. And that number doesn't even include the daily briefing, so there's a ton of extra TLDR every single day. Secondly, everything on Nebula is ad-free, and that's not just TLDR either, that's all of your favorite creators, like Wendover Productions, Real Life Law, Polymatter, Legal Eagle, Half is Interesting, and many others. And all of this content is ad-free, so there's no mid-rolls, and I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. Thirdly, signing up and watching on Nebula really helps the channel. Here's the maths. TLDR viewers signing up to Nebula has significantly improved our ability to monetize our content, which in turn has allowed us to begin employing more people and investing more in new technology to improve our content. Now, you might not have noticed it immediately, but you will very soon, and signing up is super helpful. So you're convinced, right? Did I do it in a minute? Who knows, this is pre-recorded. Anyway, if you do want to sign up to Nebula, I've got good news, because we've done a deal with CuriosityStream, home to the best documentaries available online. So if you sign up to their streaming service using the link in the description, you'll get CuriosityStream for the crazy low price of $14.79 a year. And you'll also get access to Nebula, that's right, two streaming services for less than a dollar a month. And by the way, CuriosityStream is awesome. It contains absolutely boatloads of high quality documentaries on all kinds of topics that I know TLDR viewers are going to love. So if you want to get both for less than $15 a year, then the link is in the description. And if not, well, you can't say I haven't tried to convince you. Thanks for your support.